Well, Africa has joined the global economy and we're rolling out a high number of uh, high-profile technology entrepreneurs that including Jason Ndoku. Now, unlike its Silicon Valley counterparts, African technology entrepreneurs have to approach building their businesses with a different market in mind. Now, Finn Week spoke to some of the local entrepreneurs trying to make it big on the global scene. Joining me now to take a look at this, Garth Tennyson and Simona Levitt, both from Finn Week, and Jaco van Veek, MD of Snapple. Thank you for joining us today. Um, so, so, God, let's spend a little bit of time just looking at uh, Jason Joku's story and why you chose to have this uh, as the cover story this week. I mean, uh, what what kind of a theme were you trying to get at here? Well, uh, I guess it's a it's a great lesson for any um, African tech entrepreneur. Basically what you've got is um, Jason and Joku, a product himself of the um, African diaspora, grows up in, in London watching his mom and her, her friends watch uh, Nollywood movies, which is the, the term used to describe Nigeria's uh, movie industry. And he eventually comes up with a, with a scheme to, to put these videos on YouTube. Um, and eventually monetizes it, and today he's a he's a millionaire. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, just looking at Nollywood right now, it's the world's second largest movie industry. That's after Bollywood. So Hollywood only uh, coming in third place there. Nollywood movies to Nigeria, very much what Starbucks is to states, is uh, you know one of the comments there. Uh, what are your thoughts on kind of the, the key lessons, I suppose, that you might be able to take from Jason's story? I think there's a lot of lessons that you can take from his story. Um, probably the most important is that he understands his customer. Um, he's, he's understood the emotional connection they have um, and he's really tapped into that and provided it in a way um, that is accessible to them. So I think that's one of the key, key lessons. Um, the other thing that I found very interesting is that he doesn't do any advertising and I think we forget very often when we're starting up companies that we you think of the full marketing plan, um, but actually a lot of power comes through word of mouth and just actually the community itself um, talking about your product. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, let's bring you into the conversation, Jacob, yes. because I'm not going to speak, you know, broadly about Jason's story. Of course, he is a famous <laughs> entrepreneur in uh, that has made it. Uh, you know, globally, um, and a multi-million dollar business. But tell us about the beginnings of Snapple, because you saw a gap in the market, I assume, and uh, you're filling that. Yes, uh, we actually saw a gap in the South African market uh, for an online billing system, a software as a service solution. And uh, we decided to start that business in 2009. We called it Snapple. Uh, it's focused uh, on businesses who just do recurring mm. or subscription billing. And we automate credit card uh, collections and debit order collections for these businesses. And we came to a stage where we decided, look, we are relatively successful in South Africa, which is a key thing for any entrepreneur is first be successful in your own market before you know, venturing into markets that you don't know anything about. Mm -hmm. um, and we decided to launch globally. We saw a need for the product um, and that's where we got started on the 1st of March, 2010, we launched internationally. And uh, tell us about your experiences of moving into new markets. Uh, what are the uh, you know, things that you are learning now along the way that you didn't know at the start? Look, we learned many hard lessons. Um, there's many things you don't take into consideration. And funnily enough, those are the most basic things, um, such as time zones. You know, we are a business to business uh, solution. So obviously time zones play a big role in supporting businesses overseas. Um, another issue was language. We all assume that everybody speaks English. Um, and that's not the case. Uh, the majority mm -hmm. of people you deal with internationally have a basic understanding of English, but it might not even be the same understanding as we might have in South Africa. Um, that's why we're focusing more on the British speaking um, English countries. Um, and then also, I mean, th there are many other factors that play a role, but you can't just approach the international market thinking you're gonna throw money at marketing. Because at the end of the day, building relationships and networking and communicating with um, you know, your fellow person abroad is the easiest way to actually build trust in your business. And I think that's what entrepreneurs should focus on. How much of an issue was um, broadband penetration and the, the lack of in internet infrastructure in South Africa um, for, for you? It's your a business? big problem for us. I mean, as a South African business um, and starting out in South Africa, we have all our infrastructure internationally. And that's a testament to how lacking infrastructure is in South Africa. Is that a lot more costly for you? Uh, well, it's a lot cheaper for us to have it internationally. Well, I suppose yeah, you have to take that decision, but ultimately it would be ideal to have it here. But of course, yes, yeah. there's performance uh, issues with regards to our South African businesses making use of our services. 
Um, so, I mean, broadband is the most, I'd say, the most debilitating problem we have in South Africa with regards to online business. Just on that, and if I can bring the cover story back in, yeah, um, I think I think w one of the lessons to take out of the story is, first of all, Jason and Jorkin, obviously he's got Nigerian roots, but he's actually a, a guy from London. If you listen to him talk, he's got a quite a thick South London accent, and um, he's so he's from a market where there's very sophisticated um, internet infrastructure in place. And 90% of his clientele are situated outside of Africa. Mm -hmm. So he's taking an African product and he's actually exporting it to the rest of the world. He's, he's tapping into that 40 billion US dollars um, in, in Africa diaspora money that gets sent back to the continent every, every um, year. And um, his, his biggest markets are the US, Canada, the UK, Italy, and, and Germany, apparently. So again, it, it, it reinforces what um, Yaku was saying in that most of his market is actually outside of the continent and one of the barriers I guess is the fact that there isn't deep enough broadband penetration on the African continent. Mm -hmm. And I suppose, you know, if you just look at the article, he really is tapping into the cultural ties that Nigerians uh, who live offshore have with Nigeria and of course the connection they have with Nollywood films and that, uh, that again, another, uh, another lesson there, you know, being able to, to look at uh, perhaps if you are operating outside of your market, look at what people like yourself are, are longing for when it comes to, to your market back home. I, th I think the other interesting thing is why did it take a guy from London to, to come up with this idea? You know, I'm not, I don't mean it in, in any way as a criticism of him. It's, it's a great example. But again, it's, I think a, a few weeks ago we did a, a, a show on a, on a cover story um, d done by Finwick where most of the um, CEOs we profiled were actually, they had some overseas connection. They were either born there or they were the, the children of immigrants, etc. Um, and once again, it's someone from the outside coming into Africa. He's now based in, in Lagos. Um, and, and sort of tapping into the, the creative energy in Africa. Mm -hmm. let's, let's talk about Africa and where that fits into to Snapple's future. Does it fit into the future or is broadband the big issue right now? Yes, of course um, Africa fits into Snapple's future. I mean, to be honest, uh, South Africa probably has one of the poorest broadband infrastructures in the whole of Africa. So you have to take that into consideration as well. Our cost per megabyte in South Africa is more expensive than anywhere else in Africa. Give us an ex example of some of the key countries right now that are doing a lot better than South Africa. So Ghana, Nigeria, especially Nigeria. Kenya is also doing very well. Um, we'd like to take our product into these countries, but there's obviously other factors to consider, such as currencies, the volatility of the exchange rate. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we're dealing with businesses in these uh, economies, we need to take that into account. and. That's where we've been burnt in the past, especially with the U.S. market and mm -hmm. trying to sell in U.S. dollar and bringing this back into South Africa. It's a very expensive exercise. Mm -hmm. Out of interest, what is the perception in foreign countries of South African entrepreneurs and South African businesses? Well, from the time I spent um, in Silicon Valley and speaking to um, especially U.S. venture capitalists and entrepreneurs in the U.S., they have a very positive view on South African uh, startup businesses and entrepreneurs. They, they think we've got what it takes to make it globally and they're also very willing to invest in us. Well, that's a good, that's a good thing. Um, are they investing from, from your experience? We've are you seeing, yeah. um, they, you know, is it many technology startups? Uh, we've seen many technology startups getting investment, but majority of the investment coming from overseas, there's a gap in South Africa, I believe, with regards to investors investing in businesses and then also having the skills to back up that investment and actually help the business take their, their product to a global market, you know. Um, just giving money or throwing money at a business is not a solution to getting it started and getting it going in the global economy.